let's try to dig into this. After these things, let me, let me give you, I'm, I'm going to try to do this a little different tonight because I, I want to give you an overview of where we're going that I didn't do last week. I want to give you an overview of where we're going, why I'm going there tonight, because we're not going to be in Revelation per se tonight. We're going to be looking at some foundational stuff because of the last study we had, which was the Laodicean church. Now, if you remember the Laodicean church, it was a church that is the lukewarm church. And so tonight I want to address what, what were some of their challenges as a lukewarm church, which are very similar to our challenges that we don't think about as being the reason we're lukewarm. We think about, well, we've just lost our passion. We've just, we've just, uh, we've just missed um, the excitement of being close to the Lord. Or, you know, I fell away from the faith or whatever those things are. But we, we miss what, what Jesus actually talks about in giving this revelation and what we learn from all the other foundational work that if we go back and we're going to be looking next week at Matthew 24 and 25. And so if you look there, you begin to see what, what it was that Jesus was warning them about. And you look at the two questions the disciples had. In, when, it, when they were asking in Matthew, they asked Jesus, okay, you say you're going away. We've got two questions. One, when are you going to destroy the temple? And two, how, what are going to be the signs that, that, you're, that you're coming back? How will we know you're coming back? I want you to note tonight, listen, I want you to note tonight that Jesus doesn't answer either one of those questions. Why? Because that's not his priority. His priority is to tell them what they need to, do, to know to remain strong. And his priority is that you need to, to protect and keep pure the teachings of God. Don't let other things bleed in that we then become to call Christian. And that's what's happened in our church. Much has bled into the church that we've accepted, well, that's just kind of the tradition of our church. And then eventually we begin to call those things, whatever they are, Christian things. And we begin to def define our Christianity by those things. And yet, that's not what Christianity is at all. And Jesus is warning them, protect the purity of the word. Don't lose that. So you can ask these other things that you think are critically important, but Jesus is saying, don't miss the fact that that's what's important because you're going to be challenged. And when we get to Matthew 24 and 25, you're going to see these huge challenges coming on the church at the end times. And Jesus says what you're going to need to combat those challenges is not to be physically strong. What you're going to need is purity of the faith. What you're going to need is not just a moral constitution. What you're going to need is to retain and hold on tight to pure teaching. Don't lose that. And so what does he t tell them in Matthew 24? Beware of false teachers. Be careful of false teachers. Don't let this stuff bleed in. <sighs> Can I use your mom as an example here? You know what I'm talking about? I meant to ask you before, but I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So here, here, I'll give you one example that's very dear to us, very close to us. Elva's mother never saw her daddy. The tradition, can I say that that way? The tradition, the belief in that community was that if somebody never saw their daddy, that they had certain powers. 
And among those powers were to be able to heal babies with thrash by blowing in their mouth. That came to be accepted by that community as a blessing from God. God gave her that ability. And so everybody in the community would bring their babies to Elvis' mama to blow for thrash. Now may I just tell you, that's witchcraft. And yet it was accepted as Christian and a blessing from God. Now that may seem like to you an extreme example, but in the, in, in the, the Bible Belt, stuff like that has crept into the church for centuries. And it's come to be accepted as that is just part of the Christian faith. And you watch some of these bizarre things that happen on television in the name of Christ. And you realize this is not Christian either. And you realize how many things have, have crept into the church. Well, I'll, I'll just give you one. Some of you may, may be upset with me tonight. I didn't mention this the other night, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention it tonight. If you get mad at me, you can just get mad at me. Um, Veneration of de dead loved ones is an animistic practice. It is not a Christian practice. When we, when we go to the graves and we talk to our dead loved ones, that's an animistic thing. That is not a Christian thing. And we're practicing animistic practices when we do that. And we can give ourselves excuses by saying, well, it, it makes me feel better, it does this, it does that. But all of those are just justifications for, for a practice that's anti-Christian. When we take flowers to the graveside, we're venerating dead loved ones. Now, that, that, all those may seem kind of innocent, but those are practices that have crept into the church that not only have we considered Christian, but honorable. Very honorable types of things to honor those that we loved by doing these things, but they're, they're venerations. And so we begin to cross those lines and we even accept it as part of our Christian faith. So whether we're accepting witchcraft into the church, which is what happened there with Elvis' mom, or we're just practicing what seems like rather innocent things that, we're, that are noble and honorable because we're honoring those that we loved, we, we begin to cross those lines. And, and so Jesus is warning them in Matthew, make sure you keep the faith pure. Okay, Ruthie. Well, the, so how do you, I mean, yeah, we say we do it and, and we incorporate it into our faith and the Christmas feast lines that we're choosing, that Jesus is for, I mean, you have to draw the line in the sand very soon you, with a lot of that stuff. You can, and, uh, and my point tonight is not to try to make anybody feel guilty, but to simply think about these things and realize that they're not purely Christian. The, some of the texts that you're talking about concerning Christmas trees, and do not bring a tree into your house and decorate it with silver and gold, is what the text says. Basically, those were, were warnings against building idols out of wood and gold and silver. Yeah. So, we never, we never should be um, ignorant of the fact that the apostles and Christ himself were not shy about using the traditions to make a point. 
Jesus, Jesus used the tradition we talked about just a week or so ago of baptism, of the Jewish baptism, to make a point about who he is and that he is the, the one who is the redeemer. He is the one who provides forgiveness for all sin. Uh, the, the day of atonement and um, communion uh, came out of the traditions on, the, on the, the days of atonement. So those kind of uses of other things was not an improper thing. Jesus used those things to say, I am the completion of who, what you've been looking for. So we just have to start dividing those things up and not do anything that, that we are convicted about that would bring um, an offense between us and God, uh, I guess is the best way to put it. We, we, don't want to look, we don't want to be looking for a demon behind every bush or we get into legalistic practices and we have to do this and we can't do that and we, we, we can't, the Jehovah's Witness thing, we can't celebrate Christmas, we can't celebrate birthdays, we can't do this, can't do that. just honoring what she gave to my life. It's not, you know, so I think it's kind of what drives us. Yeah, we just, we, what we do need to do is be aware. We need to be aware that we very easily drag these things into the church. And then what happens is our faith is watered down or it's polluted. Why? Because we have drugged things in that aren't purely Christian and we've labeled them Christian. That, that presumption of making them a Christian thing is what I've got the problem with. You know, if, if I, uh, I put up a gravestone for my mother, okay, that, that I can go back to Old Testament and make an argument for, for putting up a gravestone like I did for my mother. But I can also make a purely... Um, uh, animistic argument that I shouldn't, shouldn't do that. What we have to do is be aware of where those problems are and then make sure we're not assigning the Christian label to those things. I can be an honorable person. Perhaps I would feel comfortable taking those flowers to a graveside and leaving them, but I'm not going to label that a Christian act. I'm not going to label that part of my Christian faith. I will label that as you did, my honoring my mother or my father or whatever. But I'm not going to assign that as purely Christian. I'm, I might view it as part of the result of my Christian faith, but I'm not going to say that is what it is. I'm not going to say it is Christian to do that. Do you, do you understand the distinction I'm trying to make here? I don't, I don't want to overdo this right here. But this is where the pollution comes into the church is when we begin to assign those Christian labels to things and say, this is part of my Christian faith. Okay. Um, I think the, the Christmas tree, the, I mean, the, the, what we celebrate at Easter is really uh, a takeoff on Aster and, and the, the worship of a goddess. And so... How do I make those distinctions is important. And, and me not assigning a Christian label to many of those things is really important because what Jesus is going to warn us about in Matthew 24 and 25, and before we even get there as we think about the, the lukewarm church, the reason it's lukewarm is because they're not, they're not abiding by the pure teaching of the word. Now, it's, it's not just that we've watered down our enthusiasm that makes us lukewarm. It's that we've watered down our theology that makes us lukewarm. We had a couple people come here visiting with one of our members, and uh, they came, and then later she went to another church that they belonged to, and that was the deal. We'll come here and you go there. 
And the reason they wanted her to go there is because the spirit was not alive here in this church. Well, how do they define that? They define that by I'm jumping up and down during the service and I'm screaming and yelling and I'm dancing and I'm, I'm, th- I'm throwing pom-poms and I'm waving flags. And that's the spirit of God in their mind. To assign that to the Christian faith is like assigning purely animistic practices of triple baptisms in salt water and planting salt water around your house for, bab- for purity and, and, and protection as being part of my Christian faith. That's no more Christian than my dancing down the middle of the street. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we have assigned that to our faith and said, that's what Christianity is about. That's what the Spirit is really all about. And we're being warned against against those kind of things. That's what makes us lukewarm. We may look passionate. We may dance and sing and and jump up and down and scream and crawl under the pews. But that doesn't make us holy. It doesn't make us Christian. Okay? So that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so with that, all that said is a precursor. Let's jump into this. The message from the ruler of God's creation. John, John was told to record three things in the book of Revelation. So here's the three things he was told record what he had seen of the glorified Jesus, what he had seen of the glorified Christ. He was told to record the spiritual condition of those seven churches. Now, why why would you think that he was told to record the spiritual condition of those seven churches? For our... um Education. Okay, our education. Essentially, there were good things he wanted to say. You're doing this well. This is, this is what we need to be doing in these end times. There were things he said, but I have this against you. That he was saying, be careful, these are pitfalls. And understand that right now, as we, as we get ready to go into the end times, we are in the, the church of lukewarmness. And you can look around the world and you begin to see what people are excited about in churches for the most part, and they get all excited about it, and those churches grow tremendously numerically, are the light shows and the fog machines and the, and the big bands and and all of the stuff that goes with that. That's what people get excited about because that's what they have equate to being spirit-filled. And yet that's not at all what we see biblically. He says, record the condition of those seven churches because there's warnings there and there's affirmations there, things to emulate and things to be careful that we don't emulate. Okay? And then he said the events of the end of the world as we know it, which is where we're going in the next section of Revelation, but it'll take us a few weeks to get there, okay? We'll we'll eventually get to Revelation uh, chapter 4, but we're going to lay this groundwork tonight in in what we see in this Laodicean church, in this lukewarm church, and we're going to also look at, uh, in Matthew 24 and 25, these whole end times, because Matthew 24 and 25, think about where that is in the timeline of things. Matthew 24 and 25 precede 28 and 28. Jesus is getting ready to ascend and go back to heaven. So he's telling us, these are the things that are going to happen, and these are the things you must be careful of. You need to protect yourself in these end times. The disciples go, okay, when when is the church, the temple going to be destroyed? And what are the signs you're going to be coming back? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not important. What's important is that you keep the teaching pure. That's what's important. Because you're going to be challenged with all kinds of stuff that you're going to to be encouraged to assign to your Christian faith. And they're no more part of your Christian faith than, than Elba's mom blowing for thrash. All right? But that community has assigned that to being a Christ follower. 
and a blessing from God. Huh? Yeah. So note that Jesus did not answer the questions that were most concerned to the disciples because he said that's not what's important that you get right now. What's important that you get, in fact, he's going to tell them in Matthew 24, it's not for you to even know the time or the season. What you need to know is to keep the faith pure. Beware of false teachers. Be careful of false teachers because that's what's important. Why? Why, why is that the case? Because in these end times when the stressors come, if you've rooted your faith in something false, that's when you're most likely to be hurt by your, by your belief system. Right? And you're more likely to make bad decisions predicated on what you've come to believe is actually Christian. That's why Jesus is, is so careful here. Matthew 24, 25, Revelation, the, the transition between the letters of the churches in the beginning of, of, of chapter 4. All of that, he, he's, he's telling us the same things. Be careful of false teachers. Okay, so let's look at a few things here. The progression of history of the church found in the letters to the seven churches as we, we've said before, we said last week, the letters to the seven churches unfolds and unpacks the history of the church. If you just look at what was, what was being told to those churches, in each of those stages was, is really the condition of the church throughout history and how the church has matured throughout history. And we see good times and we see really bad times. Right before the church of Laodicea, we saw the, the, a church that was, there was no condemnation of it all. And then we get to Laodicea and, and we see nothing good. And that's where we are. We're in the church of lukewarmness today. And Jesus is saying, your challenge is not to get motivated. Your challenge is not to work up your enthusiasm. Your challenge is to maintain, maintain the purity of the teaching. That's your challenge. But yet we want to think, if I just get excited enough, if I just work up my enthusiasm, if I just really believe hard, well, you can have faith in faith, and your faith is worth nothing. Your faith has to be in Jesus Christ. And so many people, I think, in the church today just kind of have faith in faith. Well, you're told, well, you've got all these problems. Well, just have faith, brother. Well, my question is, have faith in what? Have faith in what? Have faith in me? Have faith in my wife that she'll take care of me? That's not what Christian faith is. Our faith is to be in him. And if our, if our understanding of who he is is not pure, we're going to have faith in something that's not true. And so Jesus is warning us over and over again, be careful, hold on to your faith, the faith, and, keep, and beware of false teachers. Beware of these false things that creep into the church. So the progression, the progression of those churches is kind of where we are. We're in the church age right now, and the church age is one of weakness and timidity and uh, lukewarmness. The last of the churches is Laodicea. It is the, the church of the lukewarm church. Uh, we've accepted synchristic ideas, as we've already talked about tonight, into the church in, in the name of peace, tolerance, and love. We, we accept these things in. And here's, here's the challenge. And I, I, said, I said, I'm going to repeat what I said last week, that I thought after I said it, I thought, I know that was probably taken offensively. But I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to try to explain what I mean by it. Both our challenge and our opportunity is the fact that we live in a multicultural society, that we so easily jump on airplanes and we're at other places in the world in 20 hours that are so different than ours. And people come here from all over the world and they bring their belief systems with them. And our challenge is, as we, as we accept the Christian church for what it is, is as people walk in those back doors, we want to love them because that's the nature of Christ in us. 
But our challenge is not, is not to just accept their belief system because we accept them. Look back at the Old Testament. What was, what was the, the dictate of God all the way through the Old Testament? Do not marry in there. Why? Because you're going to be dragging what they believe into your family and polluting and diluting the Word of God. It was not racial. It was never racial. It was belief systems that God was concerned about. You understand what I'm saying? But, but, but people have, have made so much about that. But the reality is, we're being warned today about the same thing. As people come in here, our nature as Christ followers is I want to love them. And we think that if we do that, we've got to be tolerant of dragging their beliefs into our church and accepting that as well. And that is not purely wa- uh, walking the walk of the Christian life. Our, our immediate challenge then is to love them by, by gently with gentleness and respect, dealing with that and giving them an answer for the hope we have that is different than what they've based their life on. Keeping our faith pure and then going back and beginning to analyze, okay, is what happened with Elva's mom and and her being convinced of her blessing of God, is that, is that, are we just to accept that out of, because it was, it was accepted by their pastor. You see what I'm saying? We can't, we can't afford to drag that in and make that part of our Christian faith. We've got to love those people enough with gentleness and respect and usually over time to deal with those issues. If somebody walks in the back door and they start talking about all that they believe and it's so antithetical to what Christian life is all about and I try to change them in in the next hour, I probably will do myself and them a disservice. Because they don't know how much I, they don't care how much I know until they know how much I care. Right? So that's, that's all part of that. We must defend excellent teaching in the name of the one who is love bring peace and brings peace and gives us the proper definition of tolerance rooted in truth. Tolerance has been built into to our society in a term that, that, has been, that has come to mean that if you're not tolerant, you don't care and you don't love me and you're, you're ignorant and you're blasphemous and you're, uh, uh, you're, you're a Judas and you're all kinds of things. Purely define tolerance is none of those things. Our, the tolerance of our church is to, to allow anybody to walk in those doors. Believer, unbeliever, Jew, Muslim, whoever they are, and to make them feel welcome here because the nature of Christ is a welcoming nature. But not, not to accept their belief system. It's like I was telling you about the conversation of the young man from the mission last Sunday before last, that walked out the back door here, and he was having that conversation with me about uh, his his mother and grandmother, and and praying to to uh, deities and saints, and and and, I, and he goes, well, that's just a cultural thing, right? And I got and I've got to, I love this guy. I've come to know him over the last year, and I've got to be able to look at him and go, no, that's not right. I, that's not okay. I love you. And I know you love them, and because you love them, and because I love you, I want you to be able to share with them with gentleness and respect the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And know that the, the Bible clearly says that you will have one intermediary between God and man, that's the man Christ Jesus. Do you, do you understand the difference here? Okay. So I have a question. Using that example, he clearly said, this is just a cultural thing, right? Yeah. So there's the ask. Mm-hmm. Um, if 
there's someone who, uh, something that comes up for me a lot around here is, I know a lot of people that are gay in this community, everybody does. Mm -hmm. And anybody who knows me well knows that that is not a lifestyle I condone. But when I am dealing with those people, I treat them with kindness and Certainly. respect and manners and all. The day come one of them says, well, what do you think about this? Then that's when I'm going to need to speak up. But if they don't ever ask me, I'm probably not going to go on the offensive, if you will. But I don't think that that's, I mean, I'm not quite sure where, where the lines for the definition of tolerance are. Is that okay. making any sense? Yeah, the, the, yeah exactly. That's a, that's a good yeah. place to start. Because here, here's the thing, quite often when we're talking about specific issues, whether, whether it's, it's it, you know, it, but if, if it's that one or whatever it is, whatever the issues are, um, well, I'm not going to go there. The best way many times to, to deal with specific issues, you know, are going to be harmful to people, spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever is to, to not attack that initially as the issue, but to, to invite them to church, to come in the church, to see the, the love and the warmth of Jesus Christ, hear the pure teaching of the word, and, that, and this will generate questions. Then you come back to 1 Peter 3.15, to where it says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone that asks you. Well, this will generate questions. Why, why, why is it that I feel and I believe wholeheartedly that one of the best things that, that I do in terms of ministry is not here but at the mission? Why is it you think that's true? A lot of those guys have hit rock bottom. I mean, they have hit rock bottom, and they ask a lot of questions. When people get to the place that they're in crisis, that's when the doors are opened up. And, it's not, and questions don't always come in the form of questions. It's just like this guy went on and on and on for 10 minutes before he walked out the door, and, and I'm going, well, let, let me address that, what you just said. And so I, 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 get, I quote the scripture to him. He didn't ask me what I thought about that initially, but I quote the scripture to him, and he, you can see him thinking about this. Whew. The only intermediary between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. And yet my mama and my grandmama are praying to this uh, female saint. And you can just see the wheels turning. And so finally he said, but that, and, he, and he's trying to come up with some justification. He goes, well, that's just cultural, right? And, I, and I'm, I've got to say then at that point. But it took him 10 minutes to get to the question. But you, in the meantime, you're just, you're giving him truth in the form of scripture that, that's up to the, him and the Holy Spirit for him to deal with that may generate a question. And it's just like, We've always talked about going out and evangelizing. One of the things I keep telling you over again, you ask questions. Well, tell me a little bit about where you are spiritually. Tell me about how, how, okay, how did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to that belief? And then that will generate questions on their part. So we can actually do two things. Number one, never, not, not address the issue head on that obviously is going to be a sensitive issue, whether it's homosexuality or whatever it is. But address the other issue of, hey, I'd like to invite you to come and hear the Word of God. Because that's going to open up a world of doors. Sure. And so th those are, that's, that, those are, the, those are the, the issues that we've got to do. When, we, when I go to the mission and, I, and I, I teach there, and those guys, I just about can't get through two hours of my planned 
and, and usually I plan one hour's worth that takes two hours to get through and b because they're, they're constantly asking questions. And they're good questions. They're, <laughs> they're good questions. And we're, and, but often they're, they're, help, they're, they're gonna run rabbit trails and I've got to come back to that at some point. I mean, you already know that I've been up there a couple times that it was not Veritas for Veritas Bible Institute, but it was to go back and answer questions that were asked that I didn't have time to ask while I was up there. I mean, I went back to answer one question that, that I'm sure most of those guys thought was a fairly simple question, and it took me two hours to get through because there was more in-depth questions all the way through there. But those are the opportunities that, that open doors. And so what we've got to do is become very good at choreographing opportunities for them to ask questions. And sometimes those are circuitous <laughs> In nature, if you understand what I'm saying, they, you, they're not addressing them directly. They come in the back door. Yep. Sure. We're taping. I need, I need a microphone. That's the last thing I need to even get used to my voice. I just wanted to say, um, inviting people to church, you know, the, the wonderful thing is being around a person who has, is being deceived. 